and welcome back to my channel true crime and trials and today i will be carrying on with the anthony pardon trial and it is now day four so the first witness of the day is mary kite and she works for the crime lab and she's the latent print examiner so they obviously start showing a few pictures of what she was getting fing fingerprints for um and one of the pictures if is prints from a from a car that Mary examined and she was unable to get any prints and if she did they just weren't good enough. Um, the second picture is three items that Mary examined for prints but she had to use, she had to do a cast print which is like using like something like plaster of Paris to like lay on it and try and get a print off it. Um, only one of the items had two prints that were good enough and one of the prints didn't match Anthony and Rachel's it didn't match Rachel's because her prints weren't good enough because they were taken post-mortem. Um, Mary couldn't match the print in the system and the second print was only good enough to exclude someone um, but she could only she couldn't exclude Rachel or Anthony. The cross-examination um, he's asking about the cast prints again and he asks her how she looks at those type of prints and she says she uses a magnifying glass and then scans them onto the computer and zooms in to get a good look at them and she says she was only given Rachel's and Anthony's prints for comparisons so the next witness is Deborah Pardon, Anthony Pardon's sister and she does not want to be filmed and we have no audio either she doesn't want us to hear her which isn't the same across the board apparently it's what they do in columbus so i had to run over to twitter for their updates on what she was saying and it says she is testifying against her brother in exchange for not being charged with theft and forgery um she has admitted that anthony gave her the card and anthony had told her that the stolen cards that she was using belonged to um, their relative Benita Anderson and Deborah identifies the receipt and says her signature is on it and it was Rachel's card that she used. Um, after using the stolen credit cards Deborah heard Rachel's name on the news and she says at that point it all clicked into place and she did think she was in big trouble. Deborah told her mother that I think I used a card of someone dead. She says Anthony told Deborah not to ask questions about the card when she started questioning him after hearing Rachel's name on the news. Deborah said she attempted to use Rachel's card at the casino but it was declined. Deborah says she knew it wasn't the right thing to do period but she did it and she didn't know the cards were from a murder victim at the time. The cross-examination brings up, obviously, her past and Deborah has been in prison twice for burglary and was addicted to crack cocaine and has been for most of her life. She said she wasn't using crack when she used the stolen credit cards. So now we're back on and the next witness is Jennifer Lester and she works for the BCI, which is the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Um, and she is a criminal intelligence analyst and was a technician in cell phone data and mapping at the time of Rachel's murder. Now, I struggle listening to these testimonies. It just doesn't keep my attention. Um, I don't know. I mean, we're all different. Some of us find certain things more interesting than others. So she made a report on Rachel's phone log, etc. on text messages and it shows the picture shows the case information on Rachel's murder that Jennifer received um, and her last phone call was to John Anderson at 1.58 p.m. on the 28th of January and it lasted 50 seconds her last text message was to John Kennedy at 12.17 p.m. on the 28th of, Je 28th of January the last incoming call was from Patricia Anderson which I think is her mum, um, that was at 6.30pm for nine minutes on the 28th of January. Sorry, I just need a drink. Um, 
the 28th of January core map um, shows the cell tower ne near Rachel's apartment. Um, says Rachel never answered her phone again after 6.30pm on the 28th of January when Rachel spoke to Patricia Anderson. Anthony's phone on the 28th of January, the last outgoing phone call was at 9.14pm and it was only for 12 seconds. There was no more activity until the next day on the 29th of January at 6.56am. Anthony's phone had an outgoing phone call on the 29th of January from City Trends where Rachel's stolen card was being used. At 6.07pm an outgoing call was made from DSW and again it's where Rachel's card was used. Um, a picture of a map of Anthony's phone on the 28th of January from the cell tower near Rachel's home. Again on the 29th of January, 30th of January, 31st of January and 1st of February. His phone was pinging near Rachel's residence in the early hours on the 31st of the 1st and 1st of February. Um, next was Deborah Pardon's phone and it shows the Google searches Deborah made about Rachel. And she said on the... 2nd of February she searched any new evidence on Rachel Anderson and then she searched on a pro for a profile of Rachel and searched on how was Rachel killed. Then on the 5th of February she searched for any update information on Rachel. The cross-examination was pointing out the fact that Benita Anderson lived near Rachel's apartment which Yes, yeah, she does. So Anthony would ping off that tower if he was visiting her, which was, you know, they were bound to say anyway. So we're on to the next witness, which is Detective James Howe, and he's another person from Digital Forensics, and he did a report on Rachel's phone. Um, he, he had to send Rachel's phone to another company called Cellbright to extract her PIN number um, to allow him access. Um, he doesn't actually have the capabilities where he works so he had to send hers off. Um, it shows a call report and just going through Rachel's calls and text messages confirming the text Jonathan sent her, she sent Jonathan asking to come and collect her spare key and Anthony's phone number was not in Rachel's phone and her number was not in Anthony's phone. He also examined Anthony's phone and it shows again the summary of the case that he received before he examined the phones. So the cross-examination is it's saying that the Sailbright company is not just used by law enforcement Practically anybody can use it, um, private companies, etc. And then the defence attorney picks up, says, you know, basically that only certain messages have been cherry picked for this case. Um, and, you know, there were, you know, numerous messages. Um, but James said he only used ones that were, that he thought were important to the case. So that's end of day five, uh, day four. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, don't, I really don't know. I don't know. So I'll be back with another video for day five. So until then, bye for now.